I'm going to begin by introducing the person who's going to be interviewing the Minister of Defense. Her name is Tal Shalev, and she's the diplomatic correspondent for I-24 News, which I happen to follow religiously, <laughs> covering Israel's foreign affairs as well as uh, Israel's internal, political, and security developments. Previously, Shalev was diplomatic correspondent for Walla, Israel's biggest Hebrew language news site, where she covered similar beats. Prior to Walla, Shalev worked at Haaretz, Israel's widely respected daily newspaper, as front page editor. Shalev is also a regular contributor of in-depth Hebrew language feature articles for the recently launched political monthly, Liberal. And now, I would, uh, is Tal coming to take her seat? Hey, there you are. <laughs> nice to meet you. <clears throat> and now I would like to introduce Minister of Defense, Mr. Moshe Yayalon. <clears throat> All of you have access to Minister Yalon's long and very impressive CV. I'm sure you will agree with me when I say that with all people in the public eye, we are naturally more interested in finding out information about our keynote speaker that might not be a part of his official CV. So I have decided to pick 10 interesting pieces of information about Minister Yalon, which I would like to share with you today. So in the number 10 position, Minister Yaelon has a nickname. His name is Bogey. And it is very important to be sure not to mix this up with Bougie, who is another member of the Knesset. Fact number nine. Even though Minister Yaelon is member of the Likud party, he was once a member of a labor Zionist youth group. Fact number eight. Minister Yaelon is married with three children and six grandchildren, and lives in Modi'in. Fact number seven. On October 15, 1973, Minister Yaelon's IDF unit was the first to cross over the Suez Canal into Egypt during the Yom Kippur War, and the unit participated in the successful encirclement of the Egyptian army. Fact number six. During the 1982 Lebanon War, Minister Yaelon was wounded in the leg while leading the pursuit of Hezbollah fighters in Lebanon. Fact number five. Also in the 1980s, Minister Yaelon took a sabbatical in the United Kingdom to study at the British Army's Camberley Staff College. In addition, Minister Yaelon studied at the University of Haifa, obtaining a BA in political science. It seems an interest in politics was already beginning to develop. Number four. In 1995, Minister Yaelon was promoted to Major General and appointed Head of Military Intelligence. And in 98, he was appointed Commanding Officer of Israel's Central Command. He was serving in this position when the Second Intifada was launched in September 2000. Minister Yaelon was appointed Chief of Staff of the Israel Defense Forces on the 9th of July, 2002, and served in that position until June 1, 2005. The major focus during his tenure as Chief of Staff was the Army's effort to quell the Second Intifada. Under his watch, the IDF conducted Operation Defensive Shield. Now, I think this is a good time to point out that with all of his experience as a warrior and an intelligent officer, intelligence officer, Defense Minister Yaelon might be just the person we need to help chair some of our WITSO meetings. <laughs> Fact number three. On June 1st, 05, Minister Yaelon retired from the Army. He then spent time in the Washington Institute for Near East Policy think tank and became a senior fellow at the Adelson Institute for Strategic Studies at the Shalem Center Institute for International and Middle East Studies. Minister Yaelon also served as the chairman of the Center for Jewish Identity and Culture at Beit Morasha in Jerusalem. As you can see, 
This is a man of many talents and interests. Fact number two. On March 17, 2013, Minister Yalom was appointed Minister of Defence, an extremely challenging and awe-inspiring position in the Knesset. And finally, fact number one that you need to know. He speaks with an unshakable clarity and is not afraid to say what he thinks. As a frequent visitor to Israel and a mother of a daughter and son-in-law who just made Aliyah in April 15, I can't think of a better person to carry out the sacred work of allowing us all to live normal lives in our beloved Jewish homeland. Please uh, welcome Minister of Defense, Moshe Yalon. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Yalon. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Um, I want to start. In many ways, one might claim that Israel is actually safer today than it's ever been. The Arab world is engaged in an internal Sunni-Shiite divide um, and in the fight against ISIS, and Iran, uh, at least actively and openly at the moment, is not uh, pursuing a nuclear uh, weapon. So I want to ask you if uh, you see any threat today to Israel that you would define as existential, and what is the biggest threat to Israel today? Good morning, everybody. And first of all, Tal, before answering your question, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this uh, meeting. And I see it as an opportunity to thank you very much for these activities, 95 years of activities, for the benefit of the State of Israel. And personally, and I enjoy the education of my grandkids in your facilities. So thank you very much. Going back to your question, Tal, uh, the Middle East is in a chronic instability and we are going to witness it for a very long period of time. In one hand, our neighboring countries are engaged in internal conflict, like in Syria, a tragedy, 300,000 casualties, even more, half of the population refugees, part of them in their country, part of them out of their country, in Lebanon, in Turkey, in Jordan, and now in Europe and beyond, a tragedy. And this is a case in a low scale in Lebanon, a low scale civil war, in Iraq for years, countless casualties, refugees, in Yemen, internal conflict in Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, and so forth and so forth. In one hand, it might bring about a calm situation to Israel. On the other hand, we can see risks, growing risks. As we didn't name it, neither as Arab Spring nor as Islamic Winter, we believe that Although there are growing threats, there are also opportunities. But having a tour to the horizon, Iran is still the most significant enemy to Israel, with Hezbollah as its arm in the north. Although we don't share any border with Iran so whatsoever, the Iranian ideology, which is the uh, combination of uh, religious ideology and strategy to wipe Israel off the map of the earth, although we don't share with them borders, no territorial disputes. It is about our very existence. We are not ready to recognize our right to exist as a nation state of the Jewish people on this piece of land. They don't just talk, they operate their aspiration to have a military nuclear capability, which has been delayed for a while, still exists. They believe that at the end they should have military nuclear capabilities, whether it will be with, within 10 years, 15 years, or even less if they feel confident economically. But for meanwhile, they equip Hezbollah with more than 100,000 rockets and missiles. They finance 
and provide know-how to Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad in the Gaza Strip, in the past they smuggled weapons. Now they are not able because of our activities, because of the Egyptian activities. They tried to open a terror front in the last two years from the Golanites, using the opportunity of dominating Syria today. It's one of the threats for us, even with any political conclusion of the Vienna process. We don't want to have Iran on our border in the Golanites, using it as a terror front. And Iran is the main enemy for sure. It is not, I would say, existential threat. As Israel is strong, we enjoy our military capabilities, capacities. We exploited the time in the last 67 years to build up a very significant force. Not about quantity, it's about quality. And the combination of our hearts and minds, <clears throat> which is uh, actually part, I would say, our secret. At the end, we have less aircrafts, less rockets and missiles, less artillery guns, less, less tanks than our neighbors, but we enjoy this advantage of highly motivated, highly educated people to provide technologies to the IDF and to have at the end well-educated and highly motivated soldiers. One example to demonstrate our capability, when we look at our Air Force, we have the F-16I as an example. F-16I is F-16 Israel, meaning some parts of the F-16 are Israeli made. We call it uh, blue-white, according to the flag. The same F-16s are deployed by many armies all over the world to include Arab armed forces, air forces. But we have uh, radar systems which are produced, developed and produced in the Israeli airspace, IAI industry, uh, missiles or ammunition, uh, bombs, uh, provided by IMI or by Rafael in Israel, or the helmet which is used now in the F-35 has been developed and produced here in Elbit. That's Israeli made. And of course, we have Israeli pilot in the cockpit. So that's our advantage. That's why with all the threats around us, with all those who are not ready to recognize our right to exist as a Jewish state, trying to harm our civilians, to attack us in many ways, terror, rockets, missiles. That's why, yes, we enjoy relatively calm situation security-wise, and that's because of our strengths. You mentioned the... <clears throat> You mentioned the uh, Hezbollah, um, and in the past decade, uh, there has been a relatively calm uh, on the northern border, but just yesterday, uh, is the Israeli security uh, services did expose that uh, Hezbollah cell operating inside the West Bank. How wide scale do you identify these efforts from Hezbollah to operate from within the Palestinian uh, territories? Many terror factions are trying to perpetrate, to execute terror attacks. Yesterday, this cell, Hezbollah, operated cell in Tulkarem has been exposed. Uh, we have Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, operating from outside, unfortunately, even from Turkey. One of the problems between us and Turkey, the external headquarters of Hamas still operated from Istanbul or from the Gaza Strip trying to operate terror cells in Judea and Samaria in the West Bank. So many uh, terror factions around us trying to execute terror attacks. All those which I just have mentioned are financed today by Iran. Hezbollah from Lebanon, Hamas, 
Jihad, the Islamic Jihad are financed by Iran. We are fortunate to enjoy what we call intelligence dominance. Again, a combination of very good skilled people and technologies. That's why, although they try to go back to what we experienced uh, 15 years ago, the uh, challenge of homicide bombing attacks, or rockets or missiles launched toward us, enjoying intelligence dominance, meaning we are able to foil their intentions in advance. One of the outcomes of this success is what we see now in the terror wave in Judea and Samaria, especially in Judea and Samaria. The stabbings, the rammings, here and there using weapons by individuals because of the failure of the terror organization to execute terror attacks. So our security forces, and especially the intelligence guy, are busy day and night, are engaged in many activities to foil their intentions to execute terror attacks quite successfully. Hezbollah is one of the elements as Iranian proxy trying to operate Palestinians and Israeli Arabs as well in order to execute terror attacks. I hope that we'll go on succeeding in foiling their intentions. And it's been <clears throat> almost four months then, uh, ongoing uh, terror attacks, uh, as you mentioned, this wave of violence. Uh, um, and the government has been under fire for uh, what uh, some people in the opposition and inside the government as well sometimes uh, say it's an insufficient response. What is your outlook for this uh, wave of terror? How will it end? Will it end? At the end, we are going to prevail. I'm sure about it. The question is, when is the end? And what does it mean, the end? We, uh, going back to the dawn of Zionism, we have to fight for our independence for about 130, 130 years. I don't see the end, and I'm optimistic. I don't see the end in one hand, but looking back, looking back to what uh, my grandparents experienced at the beginning of the 20th century, coming from Ukraine after uh, the murder of one of their sons, my uncle. He was murdered because he was Jewish, 18 years old student. They decided to leave everything and they, came, they went to Zion, to Jerusalem. When they came at that time, from the very beginning, they were attacked. What is called the riots of 1920, 1929, the incident of the Great Arab Rebellion of 1936, they were organized in organizations to defend themselves. What did they have, not to compare to what we have now? not talking about my grandparents from my mother's side who were perished in the Holocaust. And we have a prosperous country, by all means. Again, minds and hearts, education, and uh, spirit values, Zionist values, being able to run the country in building, in constructing, in developing technology, science, whatever. <clears throat> but we have to defend ourselves. <clears throat> Between 1948 and 90 to 1973, we were attacked by Arab armed forces trying to invade to our country, not to allow our independence, and so forth. Since 1973, which actually was the last war of 
between armed forces, conventional type warfare. Not even one Arab leader tried to send his troops to fight the IDF Tsar because they experienced the defeats. And since then, we have succeeded in adopting certain capabilities which creates very significant deterrence. They are deterred from confronting us by armed forces. And then they moved to homicide bombing attacks, to rockets, to uh, missiles, and we have found a way to meet the challenge. Although we absorbed uh, after 2000, what they call al aqsa Intifada, more than 1,000 casualties. In the end, they were defeated. We went into the Palestinian cities, towns, villages, arrested the terrorists and killing them in certain cases. And since then, since defensive shield operation, we enjoy relatively calm situations security-wise in, in, in Judea and Samaria. To exclude the stabbings, the rammings, and so forth, which is a challenge. But when they tried to challenge us with missiles and rockets, we developed and manufactured the Iron Dome system. Although the summer, a year and a half ago, they launched 4,500 rockets and mortar shells against us, we didn't allow them to, co to cause us too much damage. By intercepting the rockets, by the Iron Dome. Again, Israeli minds and hearts well integrated in these systems. And now we are going to have David Sling system operational within a few months. And we have Arrow 2 against missiles from far away, long distance. And within a few years, Arrow 3. So we know what to do when it comes to security challenges. And now we have to deal with these individuals, stabbing, ramming, and so forth. We should understand that we have a great problem with our neighbors, the Palestinians. In one hand, we are here, they are here, we have to live together. But as long as they educate the young kids from kindergarten, to hate us, to kill us, to admire the shaheed, the terrorists, the homicide bombers. It's not going to be settled. And this is the case. Having said that, we find a way to manage the situation in a way that in one hand, we allow most of the Palestinians, those who are not threatening us, to enjoy our economy. They don't have a viable economy. They are not going to have a viable economy. They are dependent on us. More than 200,000 families, Palestinian families, in the West Bank, in Judea and Samaria, are dependent on our economy. Part of them are employed here. Part of them are employed in the settlements or in the Israeli industrial zones. Part of them work as subcontractors of Israeli firms. We should be aware that there is no way to separate in one hand. On the other hand, we can make progress. In one hand, to use big stick against the terrorists. On the other hand, big carrots to the civil population. This is our policy. Going this way, we are going to prevail in fighting the individuals, the stabbings and so forth. But when it comes to the international community, one of our demands, condition, any donation, economic support to this Palestinian Authority by going through educational reform. Otherwise, we will have to fight. We know how to fight. We can manage. But this is, that should have been one of the most important conditions from the very beginning of the Oslo process till now. When you talk about uh, the international community, um, I beg to defer that I think uh, that if we are 
succeeding in prevailing the uh, security challenge, it seems that in the diplomatic challenge, Israel is not doing so well. And despite uh, this wave of terror and incitement, as you describe, the world, most of the world, continues to blame Israel for the diplomatic stalemate. What do you think is lacking in Israel's foreign policy um, that uh, um, doesn't succeed to transfer or convey the message? This is a formidable challenge. But it's not just about diplomacy. We have a uh, problem. And I would like to go back to the Marmara Flotilla, which was sent, facilitated by the Turkish government. I am still impressed from what I called at that time a non-sacred alliance between jihadists like the IHH, Al-Qaeda followers, Turkish Al-Qaeda followers, leading the flotilla, the Marmara, calling to wipe Israel off the map. You know, it is a, an Islamic sacred land, Waqf. We are not allowed to live here. This is the ideology. They were leading this flotilla. And then we had Arab nationalists. It's a still here and there movements in the region calling to wipe Israel of the map of the earth as this piece of land should be kept purely Arab. But I can understand whether Islamists are nationalists. I can understand our enemies. I couldn't understand and I can't understand English or Swedish speakers on this specific flotilla cooperating with the jihadists and the Arab nationalists. Part of them, I call them naives. Those who really believe that there is a problem of apartheid in Israel, occupation, you know, asking uh, Palestinian, what do you mean occupation? If he is frank, he will tell you. It's occupation since 48, not since 67. Otherwise, we would have reached final settlement based even on 67 lines. This is not the case. They are not ready to recognize the right to exist as a nation state, as a Jewish nation state, even in the 67 lines. Nevertheless, there were those naives claiming for apartheid. Is there apartheid in Israel? The only Christian Arab community which is growing in the region is here. The Israeli Arab Christian community. It's not the case in the Palestinian Authority. But Lechem and Ramallah are not anymore Christian cities. They are dominated by Muslims. Not talking about the Maronites from Lebanon escaping, emigrating to whatever, Europe, South America, and so forth. Syria, looking to the Christians, Iraq, and so forth. But apartheid in Israel. Those are naive on the Marmara Flotilla. But when the Israeli Navy major called the flotilla to stop, the answer in English was, go back to Auschwitz. Anti-Semitism. This combination is a formidable challenge. Just the Jews can uni unify Islam uh, jihadists, Islamic jihadists, Arab nationalists, naives, and anti-Semitists. This is a challenge, unfortunately but we have to deal with it. Now, you know, we tried to settle the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for years. I personally supported Oslo. Not anymore. But then I don't claim that we don't have to live here. In contrary, I do my utmost to allow them to live in dignity and to enjoy well-being. It is part of our values and part of our interest. But there are many in the world who believe that the conflict started in 67, have to be concluded in 67. They don't, they don't say it. 
It's going to be concluded in 67 lines. How comes that we want to live together, coexistence, reconciliation, and one of the conditions is transferred to transfer Jews, to uproot Jews, to have ethnic cleansing, to have a territory without Jews. This is the way to have peace. If you want to live together, we shouldn't call, and we don't call to transfer Arabs, and they shouldn't call to transfer Jews. So we should find a way to live together. But when it comes to the international community, it's very difficult to explain it. Many do not understand, they are manipulated by propaganda, well-generated, well-financed propaganda. We have to be there, we have to fight back, and in this case, each of us can be a warrior using the internet today by blogging, by chatting, by disseminating articles to raise our case. And I urge you to participate in this battle. So before we end, I want to take you to a totally different arena and uh, use the fact that uh, I have this rare audience of women. Um, 15 years ago, I was a tank instructor uh, in the IDF. At the time, it was one of the only semi-combat roles for women in the army. And uh, in the past uh, two decades, that has been under, has gone through a dramatic transformation. So if you could describe what the situation is now, how uh, um, well integrated women are in the IDF. We have compulsory service. So far, three years for male, two years for female. Now we are going to reduce for the uh, males. Uh, and uh, we allow women to serve in combat role, we don't force them. Male, uh, if they are in specific conditions, fitness and so forth, have to serve in combat roles. Female, women have to volunteer. We allow. We have a couple of pilots in the Air Force. We have uh, officers in the Navy, sailors in the Navy. We have uh, certain battalions, which are a combination of male and, uh, men and women uh, serving along the borders. In the past, we had only one. Now we have three. And this is a developing situation. Uh, until recently, we had 2% of the uh, women ready to serve in combat role. Today we have 5%. And women who are ready to serve in combat role have to serve three years. And they are ready to volunteer. And they are doing a superb job. And and, and we encourage them. Uh, more than a year ago, there was the uh, incident along the border with Egypt. The company commander was female. She was injured. She was awarded because of her uh, activities. Uh, and of course, we benefit from it. Of course, we have women in all the other uh, uh, missions in the, in, as instructors in the Air Force, in the Navy, in the uh, uh, Army, uh, in the Intelligence Corps, more than half of it, women, highly educated, very capable. So the contribution of women today to the Israeli Defense Forces is very significant, and we appreciate it very much. But there still is uh, some kind of a glass ceiling because uh, women do not reach the highest ranks. I, <clears throat> and uh, I want to ask you if you can see a woman, um, not now, of course, but someday filling your role as defense minister. Why not? <laughs> uh, 
a more difficult question is whether I see a woman as a chief of general staff, because at the, at this case, she has to grow uh, through the ranks. It is an option. If we have now battalion commander, a female battalion commander, and of course, uh, in order to be chief of general staff, in our case, with our challenges, it's not just tradition that uh, chief of general staff has become from the ranks as in combat roles, there is an option. As defense minister, you don't have to have uh, military experience in order to, be, to have def defense minister. You have to have common sense. The IDF also used to have a serious problem of sexual harassment, but that in recent years has basically disappeared. But we have hear, heard in the past few months um, many cases of sexual harassment in the Israeli police and also in Israeli politics. You've been very vocal on this topic, uh, um, and uh, as a woman, I appreciate uh, your voice. Uh, but why, doesn't, why hasn't that process that the IDF has went through, why hasn't it resonated in other public realms? spoke about education. In this case, it starts with education. And the IDF considered from years ago as issue to be dealt by education, educating the soldiers from the very beginning of their military service, of course, watching the situation, and of course, uh, if it is needed, to use uh, law and order, to impose it if it is needed, and to be very strict, very clear and very strict. It didn't happen, unfortunately, in other uh, organizations like the police, which uh, is going through crisis in this regard recently. And if I have to recommend to the new chief of police, start by education. And just uh, before we end, um, we hear a lot of warnings from the state of Israeli democracy. Uh, we hear a lot of criticism about uh, the new uh, NGO bill. We hear, we hear um, um, much discussion of incitement towards the Arab uh, population in Israel, um, even uh, the return of uh, religious coercion in many ways. Do you see a danger to Israeli democracy? I don't see a danger of the democracy and the values here and the way that we educate the young generation. I can witness firsthand because I see the young generation every year drafting to the military. And I, I, I try to reach them even before, to, to, talk, to speak with them when they're in the uh, last class in the uh, high school before being drafting to the military. But unfortunately, talking about the Israeli public discourse and certain developments, uh, of course, create danger. It's not a real danger. I think that demo democratic values are well integrated, well rooted in the Israeli, Israeli society. But we have to deal with this phenomena. Unfortunately, it is used by politicians. You know, there are those who try to gain votes by hatred of Arabs, uh, by incitement against Arabs, or against ultra-Orthodox, or against settlers, or against leftists. We, again, it's education. We have to avoid any incitement, tolerance, uh, understanding that at the end hatred might bring about bad developments to our country. So we have to deal with it. That's why I'm vocal. Uh, when I have the opportunity to speak out, uh, to protect the Arabs, to protect the Orthodox, to protect the settlers, the leftists, when it comes to hatred and so forth, we can argue, we can have disputes, we, 
we can't not agree, but uh, we shouldn't use hatred uh, and, and uh, uh, this kind of language in which uh, part of the politicians are using it. Uh, the social media is an open space for this kind of uh, uh, voices. We should deal with it, we should treat it by leadership and education. Okay, Mr. Yalon, thank you very much. Thank you. And as I said, as I said, I'm optimistic about our future. With all the challenges around us, uh, with all the threats, I believe that we have succeeded in our country to use the threats as well as shortage, as opportunities. One example, in the past, we were short of water. Water was casus belli, a reason for war. When the Syrians tried to divert the water of the Jordan River in the 60s, we went to war. Today, we are not short of water anymore. We have sufficient water for our people. You know, it is not a common in the Middle East, that you open the tap in your house and you have water. This is not the case in many uh, uh, cities around us, in the Arab countries. And we provide water, we supply water to Jordan, to the Palestinians, of course, in the West Bank, to Gaza. We have enough water. Why? We have succeeded in developing the systems of recycling water for agriculture, desalinating water for drinking, again, minds and hearts, knowledge and spirit. And as long as we go on educating our young generation to be knowledgeable and to have the right spirit, generally speaking, Zionist Jewish values. I'm very optimistic about our future. But thank you for your support, which is so needed to our country. Thank you. And I'll call Ms. Eva Weiler, the president of Vito Switzerland.